apples were used, uh, were a critical part of every homestead. They were really the most reliable source of sugar and alcohol. Um, and it was a really uh, effective, it was one of the only ways to have storable calories um, and safe drinking water. Sorry for that typo. Um, and, and for those of you who want to learn more about this, I really recommend Michael Pollan's book, Botany of Desire, where he goes into the story of Johnny Appleseed or John Chapman, um, who was a real person um, who uh, planted, uh, who collected seeds from cideries on the East Coast out of the mash. We collect apple seeds and he planted uh, cider apple orchards, nurseries across the American frontier at the time uh, in the, the Midwest, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. Um, and uh, to uh, eventually sell to the frontiers people who needed that apple tree for their homestead um, because it was such a critical part. Um, and even in these frontier times, uh, cider was uh, used to pay local taxes. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was super common in America, you know, come with the European immigrants brought that cider culture with them. And it was a strong part of that. Uh, a pioneer's uh, homestead and, and winter beverages. Um, here's a quote from Henry Thoreau that demonstrates that uh, when men both ate and drank apples, when the pumice heap was the only nursery, again, referring to the planting of seeds for, for new cider apples and, and trees cost nothing but the trouble of setting them out. It was a cheap and easy way to get safe drinking water and a storable source of sugar and some good homebrew for those long winters. Uh, because people were planting mostly seedling apples at this time, we got a lot of new uh, varieties that were, and it was a great process because you got the varieties that made it and so were a, a, at least a bit adapted to the climate. Um, so some of these are well known or are, were selected at the time. They were selected primarily for cider production. That's what most people were using their apples for. Um, and these include uh, Rhode Island Greening, Roxbury Russet, or some of the earliest American cultivars, uh, Harrison and Newtown Pippin, uh, and Hughes Virginia Crab are other examples that came in uh, really early with these seedling apples that folks like Johnny Appleseed were planting. Um, uh, in the American frontier and giving us uh, apples that were a bit more adapted to at least to those climates. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, the, uh, yeah, the cider was a real key part of pioneer culture, early American culture. Um, everyone was drinking, kids were drinking it because it was, you know, you could water down cider and it would, you, your kids would not get sick. Um, and it was so, such a key part that this uh, picture here is from the log cabin campaign of 1840 when William Henry Harrison ran against Van Buren and they were talking, using this to promote uh, Harrison's connection with the common man and they're showing that here they are, he's there making hard cider and uh, connected uh, to it. But cider began to, slip out of popularity for several reasons. Um, one, uh, as more as with the industrial revolution, um, we had more factories and industrial processes which lent itself to uh, making beer. We also had, you know, as, as the uh, Midwest was plowed and brought into ag production, there was a lot more cheap grain um, and we also had a lot of uh, immigrants from Ireland and Germany coming from a more, uh, you know, a more beer culture. Uh, and, and so cider began to decline as beer became a more common beverage. And as people moved off those homesteads and away from their little apple orchards where they'd make hard cider into the cities for jobs. Um, and then uh, the nail in the coffin uh, was the temperance movement, which began in the early 1800s, but culminated in uh, the uh, in prohibition um, and the 
yeah, and so that was really led to the dominance of, uh, well, uh, the de real decline of cider and then after prohibition, um, beer took over uh, in, in sort of the, the working man's drink in America. <clears throat> So now we've seen this resurgence in uh, craft hard cider across the country, um, which I showed earlier, but it's, it's, it's actually relatively recent and we're still uh, trying to figure out what app, what, which of these old European apples and old colonial apples will actually grow in the Intermountain West. Um, and I'm gonna start by talking about picking the cultivars that are adapted to your or our climate in the Intermountain West, because um, that has been a real challenge. And you wouldn't think it because apples developed in Kazakhstan, in these mountains on the border with China, where the climate is very similar to, to our climates here in Montana and Utah and Idaho. You know, cool, the yellow color on this map shows the arid steppe, cold climate, um, you know, they came from an area that's not that different. And if you look at pictures of that part of Kazakhstan, you, you could see something like that in Montana or, or Utah. Um, but uh, along the way, uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of selection and especially in Europe. And these varieties are not necessarily adapted to our climates now. So this map shows the current and traditional areas for cider production. So mostly Northern Spain, uh, Northern France and Normandy, um, and then Southwest England. And these are clar character areas characterized by very mild winters, long growing seasons and cool springs, which will become important when we talk about fire blight later. And again, these are the areas where basically grapes couldn't be grown. People needed something to ferment. And, and this is where a lot of the, the selection happened for cider specific varieties in Europe over 2000 years. Um, and these areas are not like the Intermountain West. So this shows the annual climate um, for a cider producing region in, in Normandy. Um, you see, you know, at the hottest part of the summer, we're only getting up to 72. Um, in the winter, the lows are getting down almost to freezing, but rarely freezing. Um, it's a very uh, maritime, temperate climate. And uh, yeah, again, very different from here, which has important consequences to how these varieties do when we bring them into the mountains where we have much colder and much more variable climates. Um, and yeah, and so mo many of the apples from there are certainly not adapted to our zone three, four, and five of Montana. Um, some may do better in Utah, um, where you get much milder uh, winters. But uh, in talking to, to fruit growers uh, across the Intermountain West, it's often not the cold, the midwinter cold, the midwinter cold uh, that's causing cold injury for us uh, in our perennial fruits, our apples, our grapes, it's the shoulder season cold. The cold snaps we get in the fall or uh, the warm spells we get in the spring that are followed by cold snaps. And those are harder. You can't find that information on uh, a nursery catalog uh, or a plant tag. So it's important to have research to show which ones uh, can survive those kind of uh, shoulder season cold snaps and uh, and we recently had one uh, just this last fall. I'm not sure how widespread this was in Utah and other states, but um, we had a rec we had a very mild fall that suddenly dropped down uh, to below zero temperatures in late October. Um, it's and uh, we learned quite a bit about which varieties can take that kind of shoulder season cold. Um, and so that link at the bottom there will take you to exactly, uh, to a more detailed um, uh, explanation of this, but um, you know, we, we lost almost half of the cider varieties in our orchards, uh, half of the cider trees in our orchards. Many varieties died completely back to the ground, but we were able to see which varieties like 
Benet Rouge, Hughes Virginia Crab, Wixen, Muscadet de Dieppe, uh, and some others that were hardy to that kind of cold snap. I mean, this, this may be an extreme event. It did break the record low for October, which was over 100 years old. Um, but the, uh, it just serves as an example that we do the, the cold injury that's often most damaging and most frequent in our area is not that cold hardiness that's on the nursery catalog or plant tag with that USDA zone four hardy. It's, it's what happens in the fall and the spring, which um, we do more research on it. And you really need to know that to find the right fit for your site. Um, so there's a bunch uh, at Western Ag Research Center, um, Katrina Mendry put together a uh, survey uh, a couple years ago to work with cider apple growers across the Intermountain West, because we're all trying to figure out what will grow here. And many cideries uh, also have cider apple orchards because you basically got to grow your own. They're quite expensive to purchase these uh, specialty cider apples. Um, and so everyone is putting out their little variety trials across our area. Um, what we did was uh, survey them on what had worked, um, what hasn't worked, what have been the issues. Uh, and so it's a great document available on our website. And I'll, I'll just draw some of the highlights from there in terms of what has worked and what the issues have been in our climates. And our climates are actually uh, fairly conducive to growing apples um, in terms of pest management. Um, we have relatively low pest pressure with our cool and dry climates. Um, also for cider production, it's great because you don't have to have a perfect looking apple. A little bit of apple scab or coddling moth holes does not affect the, the quality of the cider. There are some cideries even that, that prefer, um, yeah, that, that prefer a little apple scab because it uh, shrinks the fruit and gives a more uh, uh, condensed, strong flavored cider. Um, but fire blight is a major concern, partly because where, uh, well, it can kill whole trees, especially in young orchards. And because of where cider apples have been traditionally grown, they don't experience fire blight. And we're just starting to figure out which ones can. Uh, uh, which ones are more resistant or more resilient to fire blight once we planted them here in our area. Um, this is a list from that cider apple survey of, of cider varieties that had been ripped out because these growers thought it was terrible uh, for some reason or another. But that reason, if you look on the right, that reason tends to be fire blight. This in a new orchard is a very serious problem. Like I said, it can quickly kill the trees. Um, and many cider apple uh, varieties are highly susceptible to fire blight. So we'll talk a little bit about what fire blight is and how to manage it now. Because it is, and yeah, because it is such a serious issue. And this is also where you earn your pesticide credits. Um, so fire blight is a bacterial disease. Let me grab my pointer. Here's, here, this figure shows the, the life cycle. It's a bacterial disease. Uh, I often refer to it as the S, uh, STD of plants because it's transmitted a lot by bees. Um, so it overwinters on a canker or, or just a, a wound an infection site on the, uh, the tree. In the spring, this will start to create this orange ooze uh, that's attractive to bees. These will move it to blossoms uh, or to new shoots, uh, those, but often in the spring to blossoms. So the bees are moving this uh, bacteria onto the, the flower. If it is warm, especially with temperatures above 70 during bloom, that bacteria will rapidly uh, proliferate and uh, grow to numbers where it spills off into the base of the flower and then uh, develops uh, 
a blighted shoot. And you'll also see that those flowers just look like they, here's blossom blight where it's, they just turn black. It's called fire blight because often the infection looks like you burned, uh, burned that part of the tree. Um, so then it can, from there, uh, once it builds up, get spread to more flowers, works its way through the vascular system in the tree to create shoot blights. And this, this can move back rapidly through the plant, um, killing whole branches. Get, and if it gets back into the trunk, it can kill the whole tree. And then uh, again, we, there we start that disease cycle over. Um, it can be also, uh, also important in the transmission cycle is when the, the uh, bacteria is building up on the flower. If you get a heavy dew or a rain during bloom, after you've had those warm temperatures, it'll help wash that bacteria into the base of the flower and, and start that disease cycle. Um, it can spread really quickly in young trees because it, the, the bacteria is moving through the vascular system. It moves uh, faster through really vigorous growth and young trees, we're usually trying to push them, push the growth. Uh, it can also, you, we see it also when you uh, uh, fertilize trees a lot, um, they can be more susceptible. Um, the uh, rootstocks, so what your trees are grafted onto can also be susceptible. And if your roots, if the infection, bacterial infection gets into those rootstocks, it's really game over and you're gonna start over your planting. Um, and it can be, like I said, a serious issue in uh, cider apples. So here shows some examples of that orange juice coming out of an, uh, from a, a shoot that was infected in the last spring. Here's blossom bright, again, blossom blight. Again, you see kind of that burned appearance, thus the name fire blight, and then a shoot blight here with that typical shepherd's crook, um, which you'd see a little after the, the petals fall. So how do we manage this terrible um, disease uh, in the orchard with, uh, and so how we manage it is with integrated pest management practices. Um, prevention is the best uh, practice. Um, so plant resistant cultivars and rootstocks. Um, for rootstocks, uh, a lot of the Geneva series are resistant to fire blight. A lot of the mauling series rootstocks, um, M26, other mauling series rootstocks are highly susceptible. And you can look up that um, when you're buying a tree or ordering a custom grafted tree. Um, in terms of cider apple cultivars, there are none that are uh, completely resistant, but, that, but there's wide differences in the resistance to fire blight. And this comes from our own experience and from the survey of cider apple growers in the Intermountain West. Um, so Hughes, Virginia crab, Wixen, another crab, and Harrison have seemed to be uh, some of the more resistant cultivars. Um, Golden russet, Portage Perfection, Browns, Major, Marie Menard show some resistance. Um, and this is both in uh, uh, genetic resistance or that they just bloom earlier in the season and thus don't have, uh, aren't blooming when we have higher temperatures. Um, and many of the other ones are quite susceptible. Um, the least resistant one here, they bloom late. Uh, they, you know, if you don't manage fire blight with these, your trees will melt. It is not really an option. Um, so if you're thinking about planting those, they make great cider, but if you're planting these very fire blight susceptible varieties, you need to have a management plan. That management plan starts with just sanitation. Um, if you see these cankers when you're pruning in the winter, cut them out. Uh, many people have heard that if you're cutting out fire blight, you need to leave a wide space um, that's for summer pruning when you see active infections. When you're winter pruning, you can cut really close to that canker um, and you don't need to sanitize the two tools. The bacteria doesn't move past that uh, sunken area uh, that you see here is an example of a canker. Um, so you could just cut right below it and not worry. Um, another way to sanitize uh, is to spray uh, coppers as a late dormant spray. So before, just before the buds are breaking. Um, 
That'll help reduce any inoculum because copper is a, a powerful oxidizer. It helps kill that bacteria when you just spray it uh, on, on those cankers, on the trees, just knocks that bacteria back and helps uh, reduce any of that initial inoculum that starts off that disease cycle. In the summer, if you see fire blight inf infection, prune it out immediately. Um, here is where you need to uh, give it a little bit more space because that bacteria is moving through the vascular system ahead of where you see the symptoms. Um, and so you want to just give it a foot to a foot and a half of space. It can be um, uh, hard to do as an as a orchardist to cut that much of your tree out, but it is important to actually eliminate that infection. Um, there's been recent studies that say, just cut it out. Don't worry about uh, sanitizing tools. Uh, you really can't spread fire blight very easily on your tools. Um, just give it the space, cut it out. Um, I'm often asked too, do you need to take that out of the orchard? Um, and for most small cuttings, they will dry up and that bacteria will die. You can just leave it there. If you're cutting out a large, you know, more than four inch in diameter uh, piece of wood, um, you're probably losing the tree anyways, uh, but that can stay wet enough to, to create uh, to that, so that bacteria stays active, it'll produce that orange ooze and be able to spread. So if you're cutting out whole trees, get them out of the, or, or big branches, get it out of the orchard. But for the small stuff, as you're pruning, you can just leave it on the ground, it'll dry out and it won't spread. It's also important to reduce humidity um, because again, you need that moisture to, to move the bacteria from the, the top of the flower into the base of the flower and start that uh, infection. Um, yeah, so that's mainly managing weeds, you know, keeping the wind moving through the orchard. Don't irrigate, don't irrigate during bloom. Um, that'll increase that relative humidity, make heavier dews that can help wash it in. And, and also for homeowners, uh, make sure you're watering the dirt at the base of the tree and not the trees. Um, I've seen some trees that get melted because people put uh, just a lawn sprinkler on their tree during bloom. Um, and uh, it's really important uh, to protect young trees. This is a very devastating disease in young trees because they don't have that much wood to lose and they're growing vigorously and it spreads faster in vigorous, uh, fast growing tissue um, and you'll lose the whole tree. So we recommend for young trees, just remove the blossoms. There's not many, you can just pinch them off um, if you're, you're growing in the backyard or use chemical sprays to knock them off if you're growing at a larger scale um, to keep those young trees protected because once they get some age, uh, they'll be more resilient to that infection because there's more wood that you can lose if you do get a few strikes. Um, <clears throat> like I said before, fire blight is only, only, it's always there, but it only multiplies rapidly if you have temperatures over 65, 70 degrees Fahrenheit during bloom. Um, and so to manage it, you need to be able to predict that risk. And there are multiple climate models that help you basically count the numbers of hours during bloom where it's ab above 65, 70 degrees. Um, also in those models, it's important, uh, they take into account if you've had fire blight in the area, in your orchard uh, in the past, um, and obviously, if you've got uh, old fire blight infections in your orchard, you want to be more diligent. Um, so often the model outputs will say, if you've had fire blight spray, if not, it's not that hot, maybe you can hold off. Um, so both uh, Utah Traps and uh, the Washington State University Decision Aid System have great fire blight models. You can uh, Traps is free and the DAS system does uh, cost some money, but um, both provide great fire blight models um, that allow you to predict when you need to spray. And again, it's just keeping track of how warm it is in bloom, um, but it, uh, they're really helpful tools. Uh, if you don't want to use those models, then you need to uh, just in, in, be very cautious, and if it is above 65 or 70 during the bloom period for your cider apple trees and you have susceptible varieties, you need to spray it and frequently. 
Um, uh, often these sprays are, uh, it's twice, once or twice a week during the bloom period is how frequently you need to spray for this. Um, so what we spray to it, uh, are chemicals that will kill the bacteria um, or compete with it. So the backbone of fire blight control for a conventional orchard are antibiotics. And for IPM, we wanna definitely rotate and mix these and follow the directions because they, uh, like with any pesticide, because it's really important that there are some parts of it that are very important to making them work well. Um, there are three antibiotic options. Streptomycin, sold as Agristrep as one example, um, is an older antibiotic. It's been used a lot. Um, so there, there's quite a bit of resistance that occurs in uh, big apple producing regions. Um, but it's probably not as uh, common if you haven't used it, uh, if folks in your area aren't using it very often. Um, but bacteria can develop resistance to it. Um, it lasts uh, for a while um, and doesn't need, can, can be uh, mixed in fairly neutral water and it'll still work. The others, the, the spray has to be acidic for them to work. Um, and those other two are oxytetracycline and uh, casmunin. Um, I'm not going to, or cas, I'm not even going to try to say that. Um, both require really acidic water. Um, and if you, the figure on the top right there shows some work from Washington State University. Um, so at that acidic pH, a pH of about five, then it's really effective at killing the bacteria. It kills almost all of them. Uh, but in a neutral spray tank at a pH of 7.3, which a lot of our water is, or even higher sometimes if your water is alkaline, it basically doesn't work. Um, other differences uh, that are important to, to note, uh, MicroShield, the oxytetracycline breaks down really rapidly. And again, you've got to spray it uh, on every opening blossom. So you're spraying it you know, you're not, when you spray antibiotics, you're not treating the blooms that haven't quite opened yet. So at, through that bloom period, the reason you're spraying so often is that you've got to treat every blossom and they're not all open at once um, or not all, you know, susceptible at once. Um, Casmunin is a newer antibiotic, the last one. Uh, unlike uh, oxytetracycline, it, it breaks down more slowly. Um, and so you don't have to spray it as often. Also, uh, a critical part of organic management and conventional ma management are strong oxidizers that, you know, uh, through chemical reactions, kill that bacteria, uh, break those cell membranes. Um, there are two types of copper that are important to know the differences. Um, there are fixed coppers, which are basically copper salts that are slow release at, you know, chemically that copper becomes uh, goes into solution slowly um, and uh, can damage. Uh, yeah, so it's mostly used in those uh, dormant periods where you want that slow release copper for sanitation. Um, but if you add something with low pH, like some of these antibiotics, uh, it releases those fixed coppers really rapidly and you can, you can burn your leaves and burn the flowers. So you don't want to mix those two uh, at a, uh, at the same time or in the, in the same week or two. Um, that's why those fixed coppers are used in um, as a dormant spray primarily for sanitation. There are also soluble coppers, uh, newer products like Provesto and Cueva, which um, it's, it's a copper in solution. You, it, you, it's immediately available. And so those can be used uh, more safely with these low pH sprays. And I realize I forgot to mention uh, underneath the figure on the right over here, these are some examples of adjuvant spray additives that will help you get your spray tank to that proper pH. Um, uh, and you do, just to, to reiterate, for some of these antibiotics that were great uh, for, for preventing fire blight, uh, but you need to acidify your spray tank for them to work. And if you don't, 
it's it's basically it's worse than a waste of time because you'll be spraying a spraying water on your blossoms with an antibiotic that doesn't work, which will encourage fire blight doing the opposite of what you want to do. There are also some biologicals uh, that are like Blossom Protect and Serenade Opti, which are uh, used in organic production. Like any bio biological, these have a expiration date. So you want just new product and they also require uh, proper lower pHs for them to be effective. And these are sort of outcompeting the bacteria on those flower surfaces. Um, when used properly, have been effective, but again, um, you've got to use the right mixes and, and get them out at the right time. Uh, yeah, so in, in conventional management for fire blight, it's a lot of sprays, um, just working through the calendar. Uh, Pre-bloom, you're going you're gonna to spray that fixed copper if fire blight has been present in the past. Um, early bloom, you might spray lime sulfur, another uh, alkaline oxidizer, and blossom protect uh, to, to get those first blossoms. And then throughout the main part of bloom, you're going to watch those models. If it's hot during bloom, if it says you need to spray, you're going to be spraying sometimes one to two times a week with those antibiotics. And after petal fall, um, you may need to continue spraying because you've got late blossoms that just open up at the very end of bloom. And these are often the most uh, common cause of fire blight infection um, because they're because people have stopped spraying and they're opening when the weather's a little bit warmer in the spring. And cider apples are notorious for having these late blooms uh, that just stretch out and keep going. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons why they are more prone to fire blight and you need to keep spraying as long as the, those blossoms uh, are, are popping out. Organic management, I'll just briefly run through this. It's basically the same, except that during uh, the bloom, you'll be spraying uh, a lot of soluble copper. Uh, it does have uh, a risk of russeting, and here's a picture of russeting, um, which is a big concern for table apples, dessert apples, but for cider apples, it just doesn't matter. Um, and I mean, <clears throat> yeah, maybe the, the take home message here for fire blight and cider apples is don't pick fights you can't win or don't want. For a lot of small growers, they don't have the spray equipment to do, or, or the, the desire really, it's not part of their goals in their orchard to be out spraying twice a week through bloom. Um, so uh, yeah, go with those that, uh, go with those cider varieties that are adapted to our climates and are more resistant to fire blight with cider apples. If we're getting a lot of uh, high temperatures during bloom, uh, you've got to watch out for it. If you can, uh, again, you can avoid spraying maybe by just uh, keep knocking the flowers off when the tree's young and avoid over fertilizing, but, but, with, but be familiar with those symptoms because if you get it, you need to cut it out right away. So I don't want to end on a downer. Uh, here are a few of the varieties for cider that have proven to be both hardy and fairly fire blight resistant in the Intermountain West. So Harrison's a great one. It's a and you'll notice a theme here. A lot of these are those colonial apples from the time of Johnny Appleseed, because in that planting all those seedlings, they got uh, a bit more cold hardy than they are in France and England. Um, it's relatively consistently bearing. Um, I didn't get into it, but cider apples, like many apples, have a tendency to have uh, boom and bust years where uh, you get a really heavy crop and then almost nothing the next year. Um, but this one is relatively consistently bearing. It's very cold hardy and it's fairly fire blight resistant and it makes a great cider. And this is another great resource for folks interested in, in cider uh, trees and making cider is uh, Washington State Mount Vernon Research and Extension Center. Um, yeah, this makes a really nice cider, um, great color, great flavors um, with peachy smoky notes. Makes me thirsty just reading it. Um, also good for sharp apples is golden russet, another old American apple, and also quite consistently bearing. It's also a great multi-purpose apple. 
Um, while it does have kind of a weird uh, russeted skin, a weird look to it, uh, it looks a little dirty, but it's got a great texture as a fresh apple, it's a great baking apple, and makes a nice single varietal cider. Um, it is fairly cold hardy. It's one of the most commonly planted uh, cider apples in the Intermountain West. Um, it can have some fire blight issues, but it's relatively less susceptible to fire blight. Um, and makes an excellent uh, base or blend for a cider. Some of the easiest to grow uh, sharp apples uh, are the, uh, the crab apples. Uh, almost no fire blight in these and very, very uh, winter hardy uh, and cold hardy. And that's Hughes Virginia crab, which is an old colonial apple and Wixon crab, which is a, a relatively more recent American crab apple. Um, both are often planted as pollinizers, which any apple orchard will use uh, and needs for cross-pollination. Um, and they are, uh, a, yeah, great apples on their own right, make nice snack apples as well. Um, the uh, Hughes is actually, uh, has quite a bit of tannins. It's, it's considered a sharp apple, but it's almost has enough tannins to be a bitter sharp apple. Um, it's, a, it's a great one, very hearty and awesome flavor. Uh, bitter sharp apples, uh, Porter's Perfection is one known for its fused apples. Uh, so you'll get these multiple apples all stuck together, um, really ugly. Um, it's another consistent bearer and it seems hardy and somewhat resistant to fire blight. It's, it's really popular in uh, English ciders and, and English cider apple orchards. And if you like novelty, these are some really weird apples uh, that you can grow in your own backyard. Um, also for, for bitter sharp apples, they, they occur a lot in our uh, seedling apples, apples that have gone to seed. Um, and so go out in, into your old orchards, uh, look around. There are a lot of pears also that uh, uh, when they go to seed, revert to this bitter, uh, really sour uh, wild type. And, and there's a lot of cool things. We found several uh, spitters, uh, these sour bitter apples uh, that, that make great cider um, and so happy prospecting. Uh, bittersweet cider apples are the hardest to get. They tend to be the most fire blight susceptible and most uh, uh, least hardy, uh, but Muscadet de Dieppe is one that's done fairly well in our trials in Montana and in colder cider orchards uh, across the Intermountain West. It is an old French variety. Um, and again, it's, it's been fairly cold hardy. It's not as susceptible to fire blight. It tends to be alternate bearing, but it makes an excellent, excellent cider. Um, also, Benet Rouge, uh, another bittersweet apple. Uh, again, it is very alternate bearing. So you will, will get boom and bust years, years where some trees have no flowers, no fruit. The next year it's gonna be loaded, but it's quite productive when it's on. Um, it is cold hardy. It's got more fire blight susceptibility issues, but it's known for uh, its high quality cider. Um, for sweet apples, take your pick. Uh, it, any, uh, uh, many of the old heirloom varieties can make an excellent cider and, and fit that sweet apple uh, profile. Uh, in Montana, uh, we have a lot of historic Macintosh orchards and they've, they've won uh, awards across the, the country for their Macintosh ciders. And, and many of the regional cideries are really doing well with those old uh, heirloom apples in their area. It's a way to really feature them and tell the story of, of apple production wherever they're at. Um, so I wanna thank you all uh, for having me today. Uh, I've told you today a little bit about the opportunities uh, for cider apples in the Intermountain West. We're seeing a uh, good growth of a cider industry, and it's a it's a maybe an opportunity for uh, for folks to make money on smaller acres to provide them with these specialty cider apples. Um, and uh, it's also a, a, a fun thing to grow. They're unique apples, um, and and it, hard cider is an easy thing to make uh, at home. You just need some yeast and a carboy, um, and uh, I've told you a little about that history of 
cider apples going back thousands of years, how it was once the, uh, an, a, a, the most commonly, commonly consumed and made uh, beverage in uh, pioneer times in America, but how that lost favor um, and how a lot of those old cider varieties that we brought over from England to try out in the Intermountain West. Um, they're really not, not all of them are well adapted. They've been selected in a very different environment. Uh, and especially that environment is immune because of its cold temperatures during bloom to fire blight. So we're finding a lot of issues with both cold hardiness and uh, uh, fire blight. Uh, but we have, we're just starting really, we and the rest of the cider industry is just starting to figure out which varieties are better fits for the Intermountain West. So I hope you can use this to uh, select cultivars and, and manage them for healthy plants and, and delicious cider. Thank you.